Krishna. Krishna. I'm delighted to be here with all of you today, especially on this sacred day of Vijayadashmi. Thank you for coming. And the last few days, I have been doing online programs and some programs related with your youth. It's a joy to see how the, all of you are taking up responsibility and the project is growing wonderfully. I think I was here one year before, about one year before, and uh, it's, it's a joy to be here once again. So I'll speak about the significance of Dashera using broadly four B's. First is, I'll talk about the basis. You know, how do we look at festivals like Dashera? What is the basis for understanding things like this? And then three significances, which can also relate with our life. These will also be based on B. One is burdening. Third is burning. And fourth is blessing. So, in general, Manava Utsava Priyaha. It is a common saying in Sanskrit that human beings love festivals. They break the monotony of life. They give us a reason to do something different from what we are normally doing. And especially if those festivals are also infused with higher spiritual significance, then they become even more meaningful. They are not just a break. In, they don't just offer us a change. They offer us a raise. They lift us upwards. And when we look at these festivals, we can look at them from multiple perspectives. So, we could look at festivals and in general the broad tradition from a historical perspective. That is, okay, when exactly did this festival start? What is the origin story? And then we could go further down. We can look at it from a cultural perspective. Okay, what all is done is a part of the culture. So, for example, we have during Diwali, we have crackers being burned, we have homes being decorated with uh, lamps. Here on Dashera specifically, we have the effigy of Ravan made, and then that effigy is shot. So, it's a visually spectacular festival. So, we could look at the cultural aspect of what is done. Then beyond that, we could look at it from a social perspective, that people get to come together. The social pers Now people can come together for various reasons. Some people can come together for a drinking festival, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> That's what they call it, a party. People come for a beer party and then it become, they become like a beer. <laughs> and they lose their intelligence sometimes. <laughs> you know, so, in the social aspect, it could be completely mundane, but if like-minded or spiritually minded people are coming together, then the social aspect can be also uplifting. Then we can also look at these festivals from a philosophical perspective. Now when we look at the philosophical perspective, we are looking beyond the specifics of, okay, with what incident did this originate, or by what paraphernalia is this being celebrated. We go beyond that to look at the themes underlying it. So for, for example, from a historical perspective, the key question would be, who is Ravana? And that's an important question. But from a philosophical perspective, the key question would be, what is Ravana? Hmm? So, what is Ravana means, what does Ravana signify? 
and this is where to understand the philosophical perspective properly we we'll need to go a little bit into philosophy that is when we look broadly speaking at the itihasas at the itihasas and the puranas especially the itihasas when there are sacred stories these could be seen at various levels at a foundational level we can see them at a literal level okay this is what happened the at a literal level when the stories are seen there can be entertainment and that's also good at one level say for example the little krishna tv series was made and then okay it's just is is animation it's cartoon whatever it is it's entertainment and it's good that at least krishna is coming in the horizon of entertainment of kids they'll be watching other characters and similarly when tv series or movies are made about this then it's just literally being depicted this happened this happened and this was dramatic and this was like this this was dramatic all these things the drama and the trauma can be entertaining however if we consider all of this only at this level then we are missing out on a lot so for example in bollywood they made a movie called adi purush where it is supposed to be based on ramayana but they made it more into like a superhero flick rather than actually a reciprocation of emotion yes ramayana has dramatic action at times but the real heart of the ramayana is the reciprocation of emotions between the characters so it didn't work very well so when there is entertainment alone there is a lot that is missed out so they just wanted to make it into a superhero flick but there is something much more beyond that we can look at this from a ethical perspective now these various levels are pointed to by different acharyas bhakti no thakur talks about this in chaitanya shikshamrut and especially in the krishna samhita madhvacharya talks about this in the brahma sutra bhashya which is his commentary on the vedanta sutra so now from the ethical perspective when we study this is where we can get life guidance that means here we see okay what did this character do at this point and this action was a good action this action was a bad action and in this question situation okay we should not get provoked so for example ravana can signify lust and we need to avoid succumbing to that and we can look at different characters and the decisions that they made in the situations that they faced and we can draw correlations with our situations and hopefully make better decisions so much of the study of scripture especially in the commentarial tra tradition is at the ethical level shri prabhupad does this in his purports frequently say so in the start of the bhagavad gita in the first, second chapter first verse purport prabhupad says that arjuna is crying this indicates he is there is a material attachment over there there is some ignorance so we can get some ethical guidance now beyond that things can be seen at a metaphorical level where we could say literal level the opposite is metaphorical so metaphorical level means that here we are looking more for universal principles so we are going beyond the symbolic going beyond the literal towards the symbolisms now this has also been used by our acharya so shri prabhupad for example says that the six children who were born to devaki before balram and krishna appeared they represent the six anarthas in our heart and the metaphorical reading will see each of these add value but each of these if they are taken alone then they can there can be a little problem so uh, and then the high then the ultimate level is the transcendental level 
at the transcendental level there is simply devotional taste devotional absorption devotional joy this is where hearing krishna katha just fills us with joy because it is just the activities of our beloved lord just like when parents have a small child the child's activities when they want to talk the child may do some mischief the child may do some good thing the parents faces just light up when they are talking about the children and when they become teenager the light goes away sometimes <laughs> <laughs> but in general when we love someone talking about them hearing about them just gives joy so this is a transcendental level where it's just relishing so if we consider these levels there is a integrated approach where all these levels can be considered now broadly speaking i won't go into all of them but just i'll talk about two of them if we take it as only literal then the problem is some of these stories can just seem childish or they can just seem old or irrelevant okay sometime long ago some people did something and what does that got to do with my life hmm on the other hand if we see them as only metaphorical then the problem is that often the history associated with that actually brings gravitas brings greater meaning and all that can be lost that means i'm not interested in the ramayan at all i just i just want the lessons from it okay that could be okay but that is not the way the tradition has approached it and then this becomes a very reductionistic approach reductionistic means like what prabhupada was saying that arthak kukhnya hai just take half of it <coughs> so prabhupada was very concerned about about interpretations which were only metaphorical and they sometimes say the literal didn't happen only like say the bhagavad gita oh there was no kurukshetra there was no kurukshetra war it's all just symbolic well that is not how the tradition has seen it so it is reductionistic and often it can be anti tradition now i'm not saying that the metaphorical meetings are anti tradition saying it's only metaphorical so technically the word for this is allegory allegory means the whole story is symbolic there is no historical account it is just a symbolic story to convey some things now the bhagavatam does talk about allegories for example there is the story of puranjal now it states explicitly that this is the allegory but in scripture is not saying that this approach alone could be a problem that's why the healthy approach is a multi level integrated approach we acknowledge the various levels and then we focus on the level which we find most relevant which we find most inspiring so if we are talking with kids then just the literal level might be good just the entertaining stories if you're talking with exalted devotees they're already devoted to the lord then they may not need ethical instruction that time we just go into the various details of the past times and the more details we come to know the more esoteric uh, points and perspectives and and information we just get absorbed in it the transcendental level is wonderful this is where we may correlate okay this dialogue was made over here and that dialogue was over there and this character indicates this and these words as this word is similar to that word it can be an like a ocean of absorption now in between are the metaphorical and the ethical levels these two can help us in our daily lives hmm? in terms of facing life so we could say you know bhakti itself has two aspects to it one is the immersive aspect where we turn away from the world and immerse ourselves in krishna and if we want to focus on the immersive aspect of bhakti that time we can focus on either the transcendental or the literal 
especially for example when we are hearing the story for the first time and we never heard the story just the story itself is so engaging and sometimes we just love a particular character and then anything about that character even if you have heard it just want to hear it more and more so here it is more immersive if you want an immersive experience there are many kathakars who just go deep into the katha of the krishna leela or ram leela and it's a very transporting experience but those who are not that interested in the ram or krishna they say you know what is the practical value of these stories you are telling how does it add value to my life at all so there is also in bhakti an inclusive aspect inclusive means we understand that bhakti includes the world bhakti is not just about turning away from the world to krishna but also turning toward the world in a mood for of serving krishna because krishna is present not just in the temple or in the dham krishna is present in the world in our home in our office in the hearts of our family members and loved ones and the way we act with them is also an indication of our bhakti and that is why the madhyam adhikari sees that god's presence is everywhere in the devo in devotees in innocent people in non devotees god has a relationship with everyone so if we want to be equipped for inclusive bhakti then at that time these two aspects the metaphorical and the ethical can be especially helpful because through the ethical aspect we can face life challenges and that can help us and make better decisions and the metaphorical as metaphorical aspect can also help us see how timeless principles are operating even today there was a famous historian who said the only thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from history <laughs> what he meant is that most of human history is basically a repetition of the same faults the same ego the same lust the same short sightedness the same hunger for power that same thing keeps getting repeated again and again the specific names may be different the specific incidents might be different one social analysis says all news is just old news with new characters <laughs> you know a war happened here and these two people are fighting a war happened there and these two people are fighting but essentially it's the same thing now this is not to devalue everything the specifics do matter at times but the point i'm making is sometimes when we look at the metaphorical we can see universal patterns and so both of these can help us face life in a more informed way so today i'll be focusing on this inclusive bhakti and we'll look at metaphorical and ethical dimensions of the festival of dasera now historically speaking this is the occasion when the climactic battle between ram and ravan attained its final denouement this is the time when lord ram shot that final fatal arrow which felled the mighty demon ravan and that signified the ultimate victory the end of the war that one arrow which lord ram shot it ended the war so that was the occasion which is commemorated so at that time ravan as the very name signified is a person who not only made others cry but he got pleasure in making others cry that is indicative not just of a cruel mentality but a sadistic mentality so such a person had to be removed from the world so at one level this is a historical event that happened and it was an important part of the lord's mission or rather the conclusion of the lord's mission where 
विनाशाय च दुष्कृता दुष्कृति द रॉन्ग डूअर्स आर न्यूट्रलाइज एंड धर्म संस्थापन इज डन नाउ वाइल दैट वॉज अ हिस्टोरिकल इंसिडेंट दैट हैपेंड दैट ऑल्सो हैज यूनिवर्सल सिग्निफिकेंस एंड दैट ऑल्सो हैज एथिकल रेलिवेंस फॉर अस सो दैट इज द फर्स्ट पॉइंट आई डिस्कस्ड द फर्स्ट there are four b's what are the first b does anyone remember basis. basis so the basis of our analysis is that scripture can be seen at multiple levels and we are going to look at it from the metaphorical and ethical perspectives second b does anyone remember burdening burdening yes so i'll be burdening you with your memory memory with these points <laughs> i'll keep asking so now normally speaking if somebody is carrying a huge burden say if we are carrying a huge burden then maybe we have a big backpack mm -hmm. then if we are standing or sitting we will look for an opportunity to put down the backpack mm -hmm. if say we some guest has come to our place and they are having a big backpack and they are standing i say can you take you can take out the backpack and keep it here normally whenever there is a burden we understand that there is no need to carry it if it is not necessary hmm? now some burdens have to be carried so if we are driving or if we are traveling then if we are trekking up a mountain we have a backpack we have to carry it but burdens are meant to be put aside whenever they can be so while this is easily understood for physical burdens for external burdens but the same is not understood for internal burdens so normally whenever there is a burden if they are external we put aside whenever possible but when these burdens are internal then leave alone putting them aside we don't even know that they are there so in one sense we keep carrying without even knowing that we are carrying and it is someone else who has to come and tell us that this is a huge burden just give it up Prahlad Maharaj say, mentions this in his prayers. Maya sukha ya bharam udvahato vimudhan. He says the pursuit of Maya sukha, the pursuit of enjoyment in this world, that itself becomes like a bar. It's a burden. Nai vo dvije paraduratya yavai taranyas tadvirya gayan mahamrita magna chitta. शोचे तथो विमुखचेत इंद्रियाखा भरम उद्वहत विमूढ़ कैरिंग दिस बर्डन एंड यूज द वर्ड विमूढ़ वॉट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ द वर्ड मूढ़ा फूलिश दैन वॉट इज विमूढ़ा मीन यस विमूढ़ा इज अंपावर्ड फूल they are doing they carrying this burden and they seem to have a huge amount of energy to carry the burden but it's still a burden so what are these burdens that this maya sukha that is being talked about so the burden of maya sukha it can be many things i'll focus on a few of these one of them is the craving itself initially when we have a desire for pleasure okay if i eat this i'll enjoy if i watch this i will enjoy if i buy this i will enjoy we think i'll get it and we'll enjoy and we might get some pleasure but once it starts becoming compulsive or addictive then the craving itself is becomes a pain now when somebody is an alcoholic after some time see initially if their level is here if you see alcoholism how it works this applies for any kind of addiction also see there is there here 
they get what modern neuroscience will call a dopamine hit. Now, now that's a, it's a hit which hits them and knocks them down, but initially it seems to take them up. So if they are here, their consciousness or their whatever, their emotion you can say, they feel, hey, I'm going high, I'm feeling better. But after some time what happens is, if this is their normal, eventually they don't come back here, they go further down. And then again they may take, the, they go a little up. But this goes on and on and on, till eventually they end up way down. And then then they drink, it is not because so much because drinking feels good, it is because not drinking feels terrible. It is from inside something is goading them, drink, 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 drink. And then for some time that goading th stops. Now, like an elephant, if an elephant is to be pushed, there is a goad. Goad is a sharp object by which you push the elephant. So like that, there is that goading inside us. So we all may have cravings for different things. And eventually, there comes a time when we realize this craving itself is a burden. If I could just get rid of this craving. Initially, we start thinking that if only I could fulfill this craving, I would be happy. And there is truth through that. The craving does subside at times. And just like we have an itch, we scratch the itch, it decreases. But if there is already a rash over there. It's not that every time we scratch an itch, hey, I feel like something and I scratch my head. It's not polite or dignified to scratch if you are giving a class. But if I just scratch once, it's not that for the rest of time, time I want to become a perpetual head scratcher. No. But if there is already a rash over there, and then I scratch, then I'll keep scratching, keep scratching. And then it will become much more painful and complicated. So similarly for us, craving itself is a burden. Especially when we are, we are craving for something to fill some inner vacuum. Then inner emptiness that cannot be filled by outer things, outer titillation or gratification. Then apart from craving, the bur it can also be resenting. Oh, you know, this didn't work out, that didn't work out. You know, why did, why, does, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Often, resentment of reality hurts much more than reality. That, okay, suppose we plan to go for some outing and then we fell sick. And all our friends are going for outing and they are sharing their photos of the outing on Facebook. And we have to sit on the bed of the hospital and we have to face a book. <laughs> we fight, why did I fall sick? So we feel resentful. Now, okay, the sickness is not a big problem. Okay, I got some fuel. I have to lie on bed for some time. Maybe in a week it will go away. Three days it will go away. So that sickness itself is not a problem. The resentment of the sickness becomes a much bigger problem. So we start... Now, sometimes we get so caught in resenting that we, are, we think that the reality out there is a the problem. But once we start becoming aware, then we start realizing this resentment itself is the problem. Mm -hmm. Similarly, ego is a big problem. See, so when a person has ego, they have constant anxiety about how much people are respecting them or not. <laughs> now, nobody wants to be disrespected and we all want to be accepted, at least have some basic respect. But if we have constant anxiety, then, you know, if we come to, a, come to a gathering of devotees, instead of greeting devotees, we'll see, when I came, who did not bow down? <laughs> <laughs> so, now, such, such an ego, which keeps us in constant worry about how much who is respecting us, that ego itself is a burden. And okay, yeah, you know, people go through their own life. Some people may respect, some people may not respect. But I don't have to be fixated with it. So that ego itself can be a huge burden. 
Similarly, if we consider, there is, of course, self-destructiveness within us. Now, this is the most obvious burden. Now, craving at least is internal psychological. But some people act out on it. Mm -hmm. Self-destructiveness can be due to anger. It can be due to addiction. Where we often become our own enemies. And we hurt ourselves. So, we do things which we know are harmful for us. But something inside us keeps pushing us to do those things. So, all these are burdens inside us. Now, this is just a small list. We could go into elaborations of each of these and elaboration of things beyond these also. But the point is, one step forward in our growth, in our, not just our spiritual growth, but even in just our all-round growth, is to start recognizing that these are burdens that we are carrying inside us. Now, generally, these burdens, if we start realizing that they are burdens, just like, oh, this is a huge bag I am carrying. Then, okay, how do I put aside this bag? Okay, how do I get this, get rid of this bag? Especially if that bag contains things that we don't need. Isn't it? That, why are we carrying it all around? Sometimes when we travel from one place to another, some people, try to fit their whole house into their suitcase. <laughs> and so it just, first of all, you can't do it. But even if you do it, how many suitcases and how long will you carry? Isn't it? So if you start realizing, okay, when I'm traveling, I thought I'll need this, 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 this. But you travel once, twice, thrice, four times, and you realize, okay, I don't need so many things. Let me put them aside. So like that, once we start realizing that this is the burden for us, then that is where we can start going toward the next step. What is the next step? Getting rid of them. Yes. What in terms of our framework? Burning. Burning, yes. Now in the case of the literal story, Ravan himself was a burden. And that's why he had to be killed. But, for we, are said, we discussed that our interest is not so much on who is Ravan as what is Ravan. So what is Ravan is, every, just as Ravan was a burden to the earth and Bharavataranai Anye Bhuvona Ivodadhau that the Lord descends to the world to relieve the burden of the earth. So similarly, once we understand that there is a burden in our own heart, then we get to the process of re releasing ourselves from that burden, of ridding ourselves of that burden. And that is not an easy process. That's why the burning point comes in. Now when we talk about burning, what essentially it conveys, it generally conveys the idea of something, something hot, something unbearable. There is, burning is often, it can be scary. It can be, it can be even painful. But, to understand this burning in context, you can consider gold. Now when gold is discovered, brought out from within the earth, or if gold has been buried for a long time, then gold is often mixed with impurities. And because of the presence of those impurities, the gold doesn't shine sufficiently. And when gold is subjected to heat, it is put in fire. Now gold, among the various elements from a chemistry perspective, gold has a very high melting point. Almost everything else has lower melting points. And when gold is put to fire, all the impurities, all the alloys that are there in the gold, they get, they get liquefied and they get removed. And then the gold alone remains. So when gold is put in fire, two things happen. The effulgence 
of the gold increases hmm? and then there is there are the alloys that get decreased they get reduced and then eventually eliminated so similarly for all of us at our core we are like gold mamai vam sho jeeva loke every soul is an eternal and precious part of krishna we are all at our core divine so the soul is like gold now when we are putting the gold initially with alloys so like that the soul right now has impurities the anarthas the burdens that are there in our heart so then when this soul is put in the fire of purification of bhakti which is a powerful way to bring about purification then there is a certain amount of burning that happens within it so now generally speaking if there is a burden we can just okay take it off put it aside but suppose and say somebody had a fracture and they had a plaster put on them now sometimes when the plaster is put you have to put bandages around it and the bandages they get stuck and if you pull the bandages then what happens the hair is stuck and the hair comes out and then sometimes people have philosophical debates <laughs> that you know should you just gently put out pull out the bandage you know one hair is pulled and after some time a little more hair is pulled after a little more hair is pulled or just stay <laughs> in one moment just pull it all off so now whichever approach we take the point is that there will be some unavoidable pain mm -hmm. so when something becomes attached to our body then pulling it out can be painful so the the burdens that are there inside us the word that is commonly used for the inner burdens is attachments they are the attachments means two things it's like we are attached to them and that is why they get attached to us <laughs> it works both ways so initially it's we are attached to them we get attached to them and then they get attached to us so that means that what is about drinking it is said that first a drinker gets a drink then the drink gets another drink and then the drink gets the drinker <laughs> so that's how our attachments get us eventually when we initially we get the attachments so these are like alloys now normally when gold is mixed with alloys it's almost as if the gold and alloys have become so mixed that it's not very easy to take it out so like that our attachments and we they become so tightly intertwined that what is the real me and what is the attachment that becomes very difficult to discern and that's why separating them is not a simple matter of just letting go okay i am carrying this backpack just take it out and drop it no it requires effort and that effort is essentially the practice of bhakti yoga so we may or may not have a flaming arrow and a giant ravan which we burn with the flaming arrow but for us the remembrance of krishna which is the essence of bhakti yoga that remembrance of krishna remembrance of the lord remembrance of bhagwan that is basically the flaming arrow that each one of us is meant to shoot is to direct at the inner ravan so when we direct it towards the inner ravan when we chant the holy names when we hear about krishna when we speak about krishna when we worship krishna 
तस्माद भारत सर्वात्मा भगवान ईश्वरो हरि श्रोतव्य कीर्तितव्य ध्येय पूज्य नित्यदा श्रोतव्य स्पीक अबाउट हिम कीर्तितव्य हियर अबाउट हिम श्रोतव्य इज हियर अबाउट हिम कीर्तव्य स्पीक अबाउट हिम देन ध्येय रिमेंबर हिम पूज्य वर्षि नित्यदा सो वेन वी डू दिस we are in one sense exposing ourselves to the fire and this fire can sometimes be uncomfortable it's not necessarily all the time uncomfortable sometimes it can be sometimes chanting can be joyful when we are doing kirtans even when we are doing japa sometimes when we are doing a japa we feel so involved we feel so immersed that we feel i hey, this 16 down just went like a breeze and then other times we feel like my mind is the breeze and the 16 rounds are here only <laughs> so it happens that sometimes we may have to put ourselves in the fire but if we put ourselves in the fire by that what is happening is our mind is wandering and then that is the choice we have to make will i wander away with the mind or will i stay with krishna see the mind may stray away but we don't have to let it stay away hmm? this straying may be unavoidable straying away that is just the nature of the mind but staying away that is avoidable so basically this fire how does it burn see, this is the soul and we could say there is krishna Now Krishna is the big philosophical discussion that the Krishna is next to the soul or inside the soul as a Paramatma. Now I'm not going to get into that right now. But there is a soul, and around the soul is our subtle body, which contains many impurities. So essentially, when we expose ourselves, say for example. Well, this doesn't look like a fire, so I'll just label it as a fire. Mm. So, when we expose our consciousness, the fire of the remembrance of Krishna, remembrance of Bhagwan, then what happens? That remembrance of Krishna, the opportunity is there for us. Will I remember Krishna, or will I remember something else? So, the mind will be straying away. That is unavoidable. Mm. and krishna does not necessarily hold that against us although that is unavoidable it's staying away mm-hmm. that is definitely avoidable it goes away we bring it back and in this process okay the mind is going there bring it back the mind is going there bring it back by this process what is happening is we are detaching the mind from our impurities and we are attaching it to krishna so this burning that is happening how does the burning detach our impurities it is through this process of showing us what is where it is when we try to focus on krishna that we start understanding oh there is so much inside me that is krishna tara and then i have to choose krishna or something other than krishna krishna or something other than krishna now exactly at what pace we do we do the turning toward krishna that will depend on desha kala patra but overall that burning process is basically it is a not so much a burning in terms of burning everything it's a matter of choosing so when we choose krishna that itself causes the impurities to get burned but when we don't choose krishna then we feel as if we are getting bored we feel i am getting bored i am getting tired it's like okay you know i want to i am chanting i am hearing this class but i want to know what is the cricket score <laughs> <laughs> then we feel what is how long is this class going to go on when is it going to end so when we are we are identifying or we are letting ourselves get attached to the krishna tara within us so if we focus our consciousness on say krishna 
then what happens is all the impurities they get burnt but say Krishna is here oh that's nice <laughs> so Krishna is here the impurities are here next to it but if we are if we let our consciousness go towards there then we feel burnt but when we feel burnt, rather than thinking, oh, this is so boring, this is so difficult, this is so tiresome, we say, oh, that just means that I am getting distracted. I am getting too focused on, too consumed by this. If I can just shift myself toward Krishna, then this will not be painful. So Krishna talks about this burning as a process in which there is poison initially, but there will be nectar eventually. Yattadagre vishamiva Pariname amritopamam Tatsukham sattvikam proktam Atma buddhi prasadajam So he says that that which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end. So the poison is the burning phase. Where burning, we feel the burning. Not just burning, but we feel the burning. And the nectar is, when there is no burning, that is when there is relishing. And that's why the burning will be different for different people based on what their attachments are. So for example, if somebody is very attached to a particular thing, somebody that is very attached to food for example, then you have to fast on Ikadashi. That feels like a big burning. But somebody is never too much of, too much very, very attached to food. Okay, they call you fasting, not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Somebody is at, so it depends on our attachments, how long will this initial poison be. But the poison is never permanent. It is not everlasting. It will end. And we all need to find areas, we could say there are dozen areas in our life, and some areas the poison may seem to be extremely long. Some areas the poison is relatively less. So we find out the areas where the poison is relatively less. Say for example, we loved music. Maybe we loved Bollywood music in the past. Now, we like music, we like bhakti music also. But there is a tendency first, as soon as I get some time, I want to go towards say movie music. But then when I have to pull myself away from the movie music, there is a little effort. But once I start with the bhakti music, hey, this is also nice, and this is so good. So the poison is little, it is there, but it is very little. But somebody, some other things, the poison may be much more. But, so we can manage the process of burning in such a way that it doesn't feel too much. So, know which poisons, which poison phases are short and which are long. So for example, somebody loved to read books before. And then now, maybe they read books about uh, novels and this and that. Now shifting to philosophical books might be a little difficult, but it's books. And then soon they'll get taste for it. But some people, they never had a habit of reading books. Then, reading itself seems like a big assignment for them. You know, okay, my reading may be difficult, but maybe hearing is easier. We hearing also there are different speakers. Some speakers, they are easier to hear. Especially if we are at the, I talk about the literal or the transcendental. It's just Katha, it's very easy to hear. Sometimes, if it's a little more philosophical, it's a, it's a little more difficult to hear. When I give classes, I get two kinds of reactions. Some devotees find my classes exhilarating, others find them exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> so one devotee told me that Aapka class sunta hoon to dimaag se dhua nikalta hai So Some people may find Oh you know there's so much philosophy I have to think so much So it's like I can't get tired Somebody else Somebody who's more analytical If they're just only story And nothing to think about This becomes boring <laughs> So we have to find out for ourselves you know, where the poison is less and we make our those things accessible for ourselves. And that's how we will have the strength 
to persevere through the burning process and eventually that brings us to the last part what is the last part blessing, blessing. blessing. now blessing i'll talk about in two parts first is that that one meaning which is implicit is that after the burning first we understand things are burning me then okay i have to burn away the burdens that are there and then i'll come to the blessing so krishna talks about sattva guni happiness as etat agre vishamiva parinaame amrutopam initially like poison eventually like nectar but beyond sattva guna is shuddha sattva and once one comes to the spiritual level then it is not agre visham parinaame amruta it is not initial like poison eventual nectar it is purna amruta swadanam it is just complete nectar and krishna also hints at that in the earlier verse the so 1837 1836 he says abhyasa dramate yatra dukhantam chani gachati he says abhyasa by practice what will happen is ramate yatra by practicing you will start relishing and not only will be relishing by this dukh antam chani gachati all distress will end eventually so the blessing is you could say it's the phase after the burning so this we all need to push on till we get to that and this is where there is purnamruta it is there is no poison there is just nectar the shrimad bhagavatam in the uddhav gita gives the example that if a person is wealthy then whichever part of the world they may go they have money to spend and they can enjoy so he says similarly if a person is wealthy with love for krishna then wherever they go they can remember krishna and they can be happy so it's purna amrita it is where remembrance of krishna just naturally arises within the person so it's wealthy with remembrance of krishna wealthy with krishna smaran hmm. so that's meaning one meaning of the word blessing of the word blessing the second is that at one level anything that helps us to get on this journey of realizing that i have been burdened anything that helps us to get into the process of burning that itself is a blessing so in bhakti the means and the ends are the same so blessing is anything so here it is the end of the journey one meaning of blessing is that's what comes at the last phase that we get the blessing where it's constantly joyful but anything that stimulates our journey stimulates or catalyzes our journey so it is when we for example feel burdened at that time even that feeling that i am burdened can be a blessing now that that how does that are the blessing because we start realizing there is a burden it's only when we realize there is a burden then we'll think of how can i remove it so from this perspective even the problems that those can also be blessings similarly while the process of burning itself that's not that pleasurable but having the resources by which the burning happens that itself is going to take us to a better place and that is also beneficial so many people they may be attached or addicted but they just don't know how to get out of it so oh, it's like there's a inner torment and we may not be released from that inner torment but we at least know that if i remember krishna i will outgrow it gradually so even the fire that leads to the burning that itself is a blessing so when we have this attitude then we will understand that blessing is not something that is going to come at the end of our journey blessing is something that is there with us right now we are all surrounded by krishna's blessings the devotee association that we have the facilities for practicing bhakti that we have 
these are all krishna's blessings so we are we are surrounded by blessings now with this understanding what are the blessings these could be the resources for remembering krishna these are blessings every single resource even if that resource is not so easy to avail yes chanting japa is difficult but at least i have that or oh, reading bhagavatam it, it's it's such a huge effort okay you can think oh the 18 canto such a big thing who will read it when will i get time to read it it doesn't matter whether we complete it or not even if we read one page during that time we are remembering krishna oh, there are so many classes to hear okay that's fine that means we have so much opportunity so much content to hear let's hear something so it's not that we can go to back to god only when we have completed all the 12th cantos <laughs> it's not that there is a library of uh, 1000 classes only when you hear all those 1000 then we'll go back to god nothing like that it is the point is remembering the point is not ticking off a list of to do's i did this i did this i did this so every resource itself is a blessing and then another point is that anything that pushes us toward taking that resource that so adversities that impel us to take shelter of krishna impel us to remember krishna these can also be seen as blessings the adversity itself is not a blessing but the fact that it remind it makes us take shelter of krishna that is a blessing so when some relationship starts going wrong we that is the time when we start okay i have to immerse myself in krishna i have to pray to krishna more when say we have some financial instability we have some health issues then at that time we start feeling the need to take shelter of krishna and that situation can also be seen as a blessing so from this perspective i'll conclude with this point that when the bhagavad gita says this world is dukkhalaya that does not mean that we all have to be forever in distress if you see the same verse which says mam petya punarjanma dukkhale vashashvatam napnuvanti mahatmana samsiddhim parmam gata it says that that if you remember me then you can go beyond this dukkhalaya so the point is not stay stay distressed the point is let distress be an impetus to remember krishna so when in 8.5 krishna says this world is dukkhalaya the way i like to phrase it is that this means krishna says this world is a university of adversity <laughs> it is there will be adversities in our life but through the adversities we learn in fact the syllabus in this university is adversity the adversities can be huge they can be small but it is the adversities that push us to remember krishna now this is not the only syllabus so don't worry that there are many things we can learn but the point is dukha is always going to be a part of our life there will be something which will always be wrong so rather than thinking that oh there will be some some situation in the future when there is no dukkha and then i will take shelter of krishna well thinking like that will itself be the cause of dukkha then <laughs> isn't it yeah certainly there can be emergencies and that time you have to focus on dealing with the emergencies but in general there will always be something wrong recognizing that okay accept it and just focus on connecting with krishna and when we do that we'll find that we will start relishing the blessing even before we have reached the blessing phase we start seeing the burden and start shedding the burden we go through the burning process and we start realizing our spirituality and it is that fire that we can, each one of us can light in our own heart while that fire may seem to be burning us actually it is not burning us it is freeing us it is unburdening us and that fire can become much more bearable when we are in the association of devotees when we are with devotees then our mind doesn't 
magnify problems so much. And then, okay, I am having issues, somebody else is also having issues, everybody has issues. And then, what happens is that we see our problems in context, we get encouragement from each other, even if others encourage us or don't encourage us, just by their example, they help us move forward. And that way, that dasera, the significance of it, of, of freeing our hearts of the Ravana-like tendencies that are there within it, that is an opportunity that we all can avail from. Avail of. It is not just on this particular day, but that fire, that fiery arrow can be lit and discharged every day. And in that way, every single day, we can be burning the burdens within our hearts and relishing the blessings of Krishna therein. So I'll summarize. I discussed broadly about four points. So the first point was basis. basis. Okay, you could call it basics also. <laughs> Both are fine. <laughs> so in the basis, what we discussed is there are four levels of looking at the past times. Anyone remember the four levels? So literal can be for entertainment. Then ethical is for guidance. Then metaphorical. Then transcendental. So metaphorical is more for like conceptual understanding. More for, and then transcendental is for relishing. So we discuss how each of these approaches has its value. But what we don't want is only literal. That will make us think that this is just childish and irrelevant. Or only metaphorical. Then we will think that this has no significance historically at all. It's just imagination. The story doesn't matter. Only what is symbolized matters. That's not the approach. So we have a, in between is a multi-level integrated approach. So for inclusive bhakti, we focus on the, tra tra for the ethical and the metaphorical. That is for inclusive bhakti is where we understand the world is included in our domain of service. Then we talked about three ways we can look at the significance from this perspective. What are the first? First B was, or second, second, among the three significances, burdening. So we have internal burdens that are slowing us down, that are actually exhausting us. And to become aware of them itself is something which takes time. So just, well, our Ravan was an external burden. So Ravan as a person was an external burden on the earth. But then the Ravan is also not just a who is Ravan, but Ravan is also a principle. And that principle is an internal burden. And for internal burden, we discussed examples. Do you remember four examples we discussed? Craving. So just the craving is like a torment inside us. Then resenting. Then ego. And then self-destructiveness. So addiction. So these are all These are all the burdening that once we understand this burden is there, then we try to shed it. So for shedding it, what is required? Burning. Burning. So, so burning is in one sense the fire of remembrance of Krishna. So what this does is, it just like gold gets separated from its alloys. So similarly, the soul and the impurities tanarthas they become separated and when this happens then this is the goal becomes more effulgent like that the soul's divine qualities start manifesting and the last point was blessings, blessings. blessings. so blessing we discussed in two ways that this is the final phase that we where there is only pure nectar not poison first nectar but purna amruta so we will get to this phase when the anarthas are burned within us. But then blessing is also, the second thing is? 
So, just the process. Any resource for the process. So, resource could be anything that helps us to remember Krishna. And also, it could also be the impetus, adversity that makes us remember Krishna. Pushes us to, pushes us to remember. So, in this way we can see that we are all surrounded by blessings. It's not that blessings are what we will get in the future, but we have blessings right now. And by availing of those blessings, we can grow in bhakti, release ourselves from the inner burdens, and especially in the association of devotees, we can manage to tolerate the burning of the fire within us, and we can also learn to expertly manage the burning by knowing where the poison is less, where the poison is more, and thus, we can get to the level where our life becomes a blessing for us and a blessing for those around us. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.